Hi, this is Justin Hibbert, and you're listening to Why Catholic, my podcast about the what and why of Catholicism. Today's episode is a little different. While typically I talk about specific topics related to Catholicism, I also want to sprinkle in episodes with Catholics who are living out their faith and theology. G.K. Chesterton said, let your faith be less of a theory and more of a love affair. And so today, I'm excited to share this interview with Devin Helford. I met Devin at an event our parish was having in Utah, and we learned that we were both converts to Catholicism. Devin graduated from the University of Utah in 2021. He served as the parish administrator for St. Lawrence Mission in Heber City, Utah. And in September 2022, he joined Christ in the City as a missionary ministering to the homeless in Denver, Colorado. I talk with him about his upbringing and conversion experience and what led him to join Christ in the City and serve the homeless. Let's take a listen. Devin, welcome. Thank you for having me, Justin. Of course. Thank you. Um, start off by telling us a little bit about your story, uh, specifically your upbringing. I know that you're a, a Catholic convert. So w- was your family religious at all? Um, well, the short answer is it's a little bit complicated. <laughs> um, I would say that my mother, she's, I mean, she says that she's Baptist, but ultimately it doesn't really come out in practice. And my dad says he really doesn't know what he believes. So I would consider him more agnostic and religion really held a place of utility in our family. And it was a, it was a thing of utility to where I could use it. Anybody could use it to better themselves and to be virtuous ultimately. Um, there wasn't really a, a sense that this was any different from the mythos of Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny and that Jesus was just another good moral teacher at the end of the day and that he should be followed to some extent and um, listened to to some extent and basically the extent that that I'm happy with. And yeah. So, so did you did you guys attend church or maybe attend during Christmas and Easter? Like, was there no church attendance? Um, church attendance was very sporadic. Um, it would, you know, yeah, usually come at the major, um, quote unquote, liturgical days. Even though we didn't really have an understanding of anything liturgical um, as a family, um, but yeah, it would come around like Christmas or at Easter. Um, or even just kind of sprinkled throughout the year, we would go to go to a non-denominational church every once in a while. And it was non-denominational so that um, it was approachable to um, all sentiments of our family, which was the sentiment of, we really don't know what what's going on here. <laughs> and we want something that is palatable and works for all of us. Got it. Got it. So you then became an atheist. Tell me a little bit about that experience. Like what led you to it? Um, and what was that like? Yeah, well, when you see religion as something that people profess out their mouths, but they don't really live up to what they're, what they're proclaiming. And at the end of the day, I, I never really noticed a difference between um, the secular world and the sacred world. Hmm. Um, these things were, they bled together um, and there, there was just, there's no distinction. And I'm like, okay, so you're, you're proclaiming metaphysical realities. And obviously, am I really thinking about this in these complex of terms at the age of eight, you know, seven, eight, nine years old? No, I didn't really maybe think in, in philosophical terms about this, but I could intuit um, a lot of these realities. And I could sense that, yeah, something wasn't quite right with what I was being shown. And that's that's all it really took to push me to to atheism, to begin to question, is this really even real? And it, it ultimately seemed to me to be aligning more with brainwashing and mm. um, just going through the motions. And again, it aligns with the reality of, well, this is just another tool to better myself. So if this is just one tool out of many, can't I go somewhere else? Can't I do something else and just live life how I want to live it? What age were you when you would say like, oh yeah, I like I did you did you have this kind of moment where you said I'm an atheist? Like I don't believe in God. Like what was that like, and, and what age did that occur? In? Yeah, I, I remember it um, pretty clearly. Is I was just um, on my phone um, 
like sitting like I was in the I was in the bathroom and I was looking up for you know arguments against um, against God's existence. There's I don't know what the exact context like was that led me to you know look up those reasons, um, but I was I was just sick and tired of hearing um, hearing about religion. Hmm. I guess and I'm like this this can't be this can't be real. Mm-hmm. And so I only sought to affirm what was already going through my heart and to affirm it with more academic resources, which, you know, looking at simple existence or simple arguments against God's existence um, only led to, to figures such as Richard Dawkins and, you know, eventually others like the amazing atheist or uh, Sam Harris much mm-hmm. later on, I would say. So um, how, adamant were you about atheism like as far as like telling other people about it and uh it was it was it just like hey this is this is what i believe i i reject all religion and you kind of kept it to yourself or were you like i'm actively gonna seek out debating people like richard dawkins debating people and writing about atheism it was a uh, sort of a mixture it was something that i kept fairly silent from my family mm. and i remember one moment when i I actually told my mom that I was an atheist and she said that she thought that I had had failed or that she had failed as a mother. Mm. And um, that's a, that's a pretty shocking thing to hear. And so I knew, I knew pretty well and pretty early on not to, not to share those things um, with people I was super close with and to be careful about that. Mm. Um, But I was, I think pretty bold about talking about my beliefs with my friends and and those whom I could confide in about this and actually you know be pretty bold about saying that religion is is brainwashing is is all these different things it's just fairy tales and um, I definitely dove into the culture of that a lot especially in in middle school and high school and Diving into you know comedians like George Carlin was a particular cultural figure that only helped to like affirm this and to in some ways like live this out um, to find somebody who can like actually make jokes about this in many ways is is somebody who I like could relate to about this and then relate to other people who found such things funny and found such things to be to be true as well. So. You know, you went you went through this process of, of becoming an atheist, of being an atheist. Talk a little bit about this conversion experience to Catholicism. What happened? Yeah. So ultimately, atheism is not satisfying. It does not satisfy what our hearts are truly after. And I I didn't know it was atheism and my rejection of God and his existence that was leading me down that path. Um, I thought, oh, well, you know, the world is just suffering, you know, and that life is suffering and that you just have to push through this, that um, it was a very, it was a very nihilistic, you know, perspective that that this doesn't get much better. Hmm. And I, I guess nihilism and despair kind of go hand in hand in this. And so, you know, at that point, the substitutes became ambition and and seeking to be like you know a major in business and in college and then eventually something something more than that was kind of the the lookout and um but along this um i knew that i wanted to be christian again and hmm. so these were the er- these were like the early movements of like actually seeing the the darkness in my heart knowing that that shouldn't be there and i'm like okay well i know that the way to live a good life, um, what I had been shown early on, even though I thought it was it was flawed and um, in many ways um, deluded, I thought that okay, well maybe I should give it give it a try again. Maybe I wasn't seeing things clearly, and I'm always I'm always one to um, reanalyze the things that I I believe to make sure that. I actually am believing them out of conviction and and honesty and sincerity and not just going along with the motions. So that was those were my initial movements towards Catholicism is that I knew when I entered into college that I wanted to seek out the Christian groups there and see like 
maybe there's something here again. Was was there a specific impetus that brought that movement on? Was it was it like a kind of a deep depression or despair or help me understand that? I think it's definitely that. Um, yeah, I mean, just a loss. I mean, there's no meaning, there's no purpose, and it's not like the search for God is not necessarily simply a search for meaning, um, even though it may have looked that way at the at the onset of all of this. And that is to be expected because I didn't really know the search for God goes beyond just the search for meaning and purpose, but that it actually goes to searching for relationship with him and to be with him. And that's actually what I made for. Um, but yeah, it was, it was initially this movement away from the pain and the suffering that comes with, with sin and life, like apart from God. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know any other way to um, answer that that emptiness and that darkness. I but I knew it's it, it spoke to something in the opposite direction, right? This is what what evil like evil perverts the good. So there has to be good there that it's perverting, mm. um, and so maybe I should seek that out. So then, uh, was there a particular person um, or group that you engaged with in college that kind of helped you along in this journey? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, well, initially, I sought out a non-denominational Christian group because I wanted to go at the bare minimum with what I was familiar with. And uh, even though I the, this specific group was what turned me away from Christianity to to begin with. I'm like, okay, well, I should at least go with what's familiar and give them another chance. And I gave them another chance along with um, a, f- a friend of mine who was, who was Catholic and is Catholic still. And um, bless that man's soul. He has been um, an indispensable friend in my life. He has been absolutely... I I cherish him to this day um, in so many ways. And he has been, uh, yeah, indispensable in my, in my conversion. Um, God has used him in so many ways. And, and it was after that first encounter with the non-denominational Christians and going to one of their services that ultimately led me to go to mass for the very first time after, um, after that experience. Okay. And, and what were your, like, name a few interactions that you, or talk about a few interactions that maybe that you had with um, your friend that sort of were, as you look back, are, man, th- those are really, maybe it was just a passing moment or something like that, but man, it, it was really life-changing. Yeah. Um, it, it really began in high school whenever I, I met him. It, you know, funny enough, we go to high school and Meridian, Idaho, and then end up going to the same college in Salt Lake City, Utah. And lo and behold, how instrumental he was in my conversion. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's, I think that's definitely a huge testament to, to Providence. And to actually look back at those early moments in, in our friendship um, has been something very enlightening to see how God, I mean, just worked in somebody who was so different than the rest of the people in high school. How he didn't, he didn't buy into the typical things of this world, and even though he experienced his own um, growths in Catholicism and in college and in his faith, um, it was he still lived in a way that was so different. And there's something attractive about somebody who's searching for virtue, somebody who's searching for truth, for goodness which those were the things that were not on my mind at the time. And, and I definitely bought into the complete opposite. Hmm. And so as seeing those things, seeing how he challenged me and, and actually stood up to me and promoted logical reasons. No, this, this wasn't a, an, an appeal to ethos or, or pathos, but very much to logos. And I, that's something that, it changed me. I actually began to think about these issues. And, and from there, this provided a basis for me to be able to investigate something like the Catholic Church a lot more. It's really interesting to hear you say that the thing that led you away from Christianity was the hypocrisy, right? And, and seeing people say they want to live virtuous life or, or affirm some of these theological principles, but then 
don't live that virtue. And then here you have this friend who is living that virtue and that you notice it, you take notice of it and you don't think it's, it's interesting. You don't think of him as a, I guess maybe you didn't think of him as a weirdo. You thought of him as, Hey, this guy is really living against the flow of traffic here. And it's kind of beautiful and refreshing. Yes. Yeah. This is where you have a lot of figures currently nowadays with Jordan Peterson, who is still confused about what he actually thinks about Christianity, but who proclaims so many truths and searches for so many of those truths Mm -hmm. and how that's attractive to so many young men today. And in many ways I could say I was in a, in a similar boat and this just led to a, a deep encounter with Christ eventually. So you attended your first mass. What what were your thoughts? I mean, mass, like mass is different. (laughs) Very different. I, I, I actually had no real clue. Um, what Catholics were growing up, um, who Catholics were, I guess. And um, I didn't even know that they were Christians. I did not know what to expect going into it. I simply answered my friend's invitation and thanks be to God that I did. But it definitely freaked me out. I was, I was so s- s- kind of scared and frightened afterwards but simultaneous, I mean, it was a mixture of emotions because I also um, experienced and, and witnessed great tradition, great beauty, things that were things that were attracting my heart to the Catholic Church ultimately, um, because I had been, I think, devoid of so much of that. Those things really spoke to me in a way that um, hadn't before, and many of the other things of faith, like naturally started to come about over the the next year and even like next year and a half, I would say, um, as I then entered RCIA and the next, uh, the next year after I had attended that first mass, um, it took, a, it took a lot of like continued tripping over myself to, to figure out that I wanted to start RCIA and investigate this seriously and investigate this for real. And it is only in doing that in investigating it for real and trying to live it out that one can discover that this is real. Mm -hmm. I think people often want God to just serve them, you know, their own cup of salvation on a dinner plate (laughs) and just like have that like perfectly laid out. It perfectly makes sense. Mm -hmm. But this is God we are talking about. Mm -hmm. He is supernatural. He, his ways are not our ways. And so why do we think that this would be, so easy and natural when he is supernatural. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think there's a lot about God wants God lets us go through processes because we start owning it. Like we, there's skin in the game. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, so what, one of the things that I, I'm experiencing as I learn more about my own conversion and as I talk with others is that I, I see it as like you're running this race. And there are these hurdles and each hurdle represents maybe a theological concept that you have to overcome. Um, you know, in this podcast, I've shared that for me, it was the Eucharist. That was the, that was the biggest hurdle of all of the hurdles. Of course, there was Mary in there and there was other things because growing up Protestant, the, these are just not part of our theology. So I had to wrestle with these, but was there, was there like one, two, three things that you really had to, just wrestle with and and what was that process like it's so interesting there wasn't a lot of initial wrestling um, because i had really had no other experience with faith beforehand um, in an honest way so it's like i didn't really have like a lot of protestant theological concepts Hmm. already ingrained into there are some you know and there's still some where it's it's difficult to um to this day you know there's there's I would say one of the main ones are a lot of the dogmas associated with Mary, um, especially the the Assumption and the Coronation um, mm-hmm. are, you know, the, like praise be to God, you know, for those those revealed realities. But also, they are confusing, and sometimes it, it doesn't make a sometimes they don't make a lot of sense. And in all honestly, honesty, sometimes that's where where I'm at is is as Saint Paul says and. Um, as providence just has it that um, the word of God comes when I I need it, that 
we are perplexed, but we are not led to despair. Hmm. And, and that's like, you know, many of these things, I mean, you know, even just coming to like believe in Christ simply, you know, that's, there's a, there's a hurdle there. And actually to like believe in him as a person, Hmm. that he is a person and that he is in, in constant mysterious communion with the father and the Holy spirit and that God himself is communion itself is love itself and all of these i i'm finding today are you know just shocking and even three years after having converted i don't think we can just go about thinking that you know this is this is easy this is always like oh yeah i understand you know like i i know all the dogmas of of mary and the dogmas of the church but that no these this will be constant conversion for the rest of my life Hmm. Uh, but it was is very much and and on this point as well as it started as on Anselm of Canterbury calls it in his proslogion I think is how you pronounce it where he describes it as credo ut intelligam I believe so that I might understand so that I may understand and that is very much how my conversion went I believed so that I might understand I, I accepted, not blindly, I mean, I still had to think about these things, but I, I had to take Catholics at their word. I had to have an open heart for all of this. this an open heart is indispensable for this to happen. And so it, it is ultimately like, that was my process of faith. Some people come about it from the other way around, like, intelligam ut credo, like I... I understand so that I might believe maybe, you know, but, um, I think that, um, this is, this is definitely like not out of the ordinary in terms of what the church has proclaimed for, for conversion and that this isn't easy for anybody. Yeah. We see it in the Bible too, where the disciple reaches out to Jesus and says, I believe help my unbelief. Right. Yes, you know, and simultaneously, so, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think that there's a, always a time where, you know, you can study all that you want. You can kind of look at it cerebrally, but there comes a moment where you have to say like, okay, do I believe this? Like, am I, you know, I've, I've learned all that I can from this side of things. And maybe I need to take that step of, of faith. And that, that step of faith, I think is things like going to a mass, it's going to RCIA. Um, but then ultimately it's that I, I'm going to be baptized. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, take this step of this act of faith absolutely this is what the church proclaims is Mm. mystery and it doesn't shy away from that it actually proclaims that we should dive more into the mystery Mm -hmm. and that's something that i have always loved about the catholic church and it's it's that it's humble in that god's ways are not our ways and there's much we don't understand about how this all works and Praise be to God that we don't understand how all of this works. Because if we understood how all of this works, we might be God ourselves. Mm-hmm. And like that's not how this that's not how this all works. Um, we're trying to understand. We're doing our best to follow the movements of the Holy Spirit and and just embrace God to see His face. That's what we're living right now for. Yeah, and we, and uh, for the listeners out there who want to learn more about this idea of mystery and how the Catholic Church thinks about mystery, I would, I would invite you to to listen to the episode entitled uh, "Sacramental Worldview." And so that we dive into what is a sacrament, what's what's why do we talk about it in terms of mystery, and we do a couple of episodes on that. Now, Devin, tell me a little bit about. So you, here you are. You went through our CIA class. You decided, hey, this is for me. I want to become Catholic. You were baptized at the Easter Vigil in, what was that, 19, uh, 2019? 2019. 2019. Correct. And um, and so now, okay, it's not the end. It's the beginning now. So what, tell me about that process. Yes, yeah. Um, I was in such good hands here in Utah Utah is a beautiful place um, for the Catholic Church. And many people don't even know Utah is like on the map for the Catholic (laughs) Church because they think it's on the map for the LDS Church. And 
it was in the most unlikely of places that I had my conversion. And I was in such great hands at the Newman Center um, at our university with the Dominican friars who were down there. It has been an unbelievable um, journey of transformation. I mean, right after I was baptized, April 21st, 2019, um, I went on the Camino de Santiago a couple of weeks later and got to experience for the first time pilgrimage, but pilgrimage in a very sacramental and spiritual sense um, where most people just go about it now um, for some like new agey spiritual type stuff I, I don't quite know what they're what they're doing it for but to actually experience pilgrimage as like the church has understood pilgrimage was something very important and very very great way to start off my my time as a neophyte and yeah it's it's been an unbelievable time there because simply like the Newman Center at the University of Utah has simply just wanted students to grow in faith and encounter Christ. That is all. And it, there's not some complex like, you know, trickery going on here. It's like, no, we simply want to provide the space for students to grow in faith. And being a convert, I already have this just energy coming out of this whole revelatory experience of just fully embracing God and his mission to know him. And so, yeah, I, I'm in, I'm in such great hands there and I'm just, I just have the space and freedom to start investigating this on my own, to encountering people. I, I have to like, even after being, becoming Catholic, I still in some ways don't know fully what is always being talked about. And so I have to, in humility, be asking every single question, even the dumbest of questions um, possible to try to understand really like, what are people talking about? They're, they're, they're speaking a language that I've never heard. They're dancing a dance that I've, I've never learned before. And that was, you know, to put it into into very, I guess, literal, literary language. Um, that describes my experience at the Newman Center. Hmm. And yeah, it's been a, a, a big crucible of, of formation in my life. That's awesome. And you've gotten to live there as well, right? Yes. Um, so you're not just, it's not just like a ministry that you go to, um, you know, every day or once a week or something like that. You're actually living at the Newman Center with Dominicans and and like celebrating mass every day, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, the ability to go to, to go to mass every day when it's just 15 seconds away and you live in the same building, that is um, astonishing. And it's something that's been, it's been transformative to actually, yeah, regularly receive sacraments in this way. I mean, for a young person to be formed like this, is so necessary and I see how I still desire so much formation even after I'm um, the spirit experience of having lived at the Newman Center having you know gone gone overseas on pilgrimage to the Camino um, de Santiago and also going to Rome um, this this past May um, it has just been a wild experience and graduating from college too. That was, you know, something I also set out to do and, and, and ultimately completed and, and I'm on to, to new walks of life and it's really exciting. So speaking of that, you are headed to Christ in the city. Tell, tell me a little bit about what Christ in the city is, what attracted you to it um, and what you'll be doing. Yeah. So I found out about Christ in the city in the year of, uh, yeah, when the basically when the pandemic started, I was on a mission trip um, out there for just spring break of the the spring of 2020, and yeah, it got cut short early. But I had made enough of an impression apparently on one of the missionaries there to where he reached out to me um, in the summer to do a summer of service with Christ in the city and serve with them for a month, and that really. Um, got me interested to do to do something like a year of service with them and so I guess I should go into a little bit more depth as well about what what this all is so Christ in the City is a missionary organization in Denver Colorado 
Um, it's a Catholic missionary organization that seeks to minister to the homeless. And their primary mission statement is to know, love, and serve the homeless. And they really emphasize it in that order because you cannot love someone if you don't know them. And how do you even think you're going to just start serving somebody if you don't love somebody? Hmm. And typically society reverses this. They see it as, okay, well, we need to like serve the homeless. We need to just do soup kitchen stuff and um, give them all the materials possible that they could use to survive. And, you know, that's correct to um, some degree. There, there do need to be those material resources easily accessible to, um, to the poor in our society. But this doesn't answer the primary cause of homeless homelessness and this doesn't yeah it doesn't address the root problem and the root problem actually is broken relationships that's what christ in the city has found and that's what christ in the city where they where they seek to minister is to that reality that the homeless have either by their own actions or the actions of others in their lives they have burned a lot of bridges and a lot of bridges have been burned and they also perceive, because of, of burn bridges, that they can't ask anybody for help and that they are stuck in that position in destitution for the rest of their lives. And if, you know, if we, uh, we thought that the relationships in our lives can sometimes be transactional in ways that we don't like, it's only amplified in the world of poverty where people use each other for so many different things nobody can hear their name being said and not have it simply be a movement of love mm-hmm. and that's where i'm seeking to enter into the messiness of this and i'm very excited to do this i've done i've done a summer of service with them and that little mission trip and these have been some of the most life-changing experiences um, that i've had over the past three years and even with them not, yeah, being at the Newman Center, being out out there in Denver, Colorado, um, it's it's been great to see, you know, Catholics on fire for their faith and Catholics just on fire to serve to serve the homeless. And I'll tell you, that actually is a welcoming community. We don't know what we mean when we say welcoming. We oh, the churches need to be more welcoming. That doesn't just mean like put on a pretty smile and start you know just being nice to people even artificially it's like no this becomes real when mission is the center of how you live your life and that should be a message for any catholic out there even if you're not going to be a missionary at christ in the city Uh, vocation is this call to mission these these things aren't separated from each other like your vocation is your mission. Even if you are living the single life, there is a mission that you are called to. And this calls for a radical way of living, one that I still, I still need to hear that, those words myself, um, living as a single, single man and currently not at Christ in the city, that I, even before going on this mission, have a mission right now as I'm speaking to you guys. I really appreciated this interview and the time that Devin shared with me. You know, what surprised me about Devin was that you would never know he's only been a Christian for a few years. He speaks about his relationship with God with so much love and maturity. And every time I get to spend time with Devin, I walk away more encouraged in my faith journey. In the show notes, I've provided a link to Christ in the City as well as a link to Devin's profile page. I would encourage you to consider giving to this awesome ministry. Just so you're aware, the Why Catholic Podcast is already committed to supporting Devin. So those of you who support the Why Catholic Podcast, a significant portion of your donation has gone to supporting Devin in caring for the homeless in Denver. If you'd like to support this podcast and support ministries through this podcast, you can get started at whycatholic.substack.com slash subscribe. Thank you again for joining me as well as Devin. My name is Justin Hibbard, and you've been listening to Why Catholic.